Hi there. Uh, welcome to Tips and Techniques and Conversations for Actors, Authors, and Storytellers. I'm Matthew Arkin, and our guest today is going to be Bo Baker, who is a sound mixer. He has over 40 years experience in the film and television industry, production sound recording. He's traveled worldwide on films such as Lady Hawk, Blade Runner, uh, Lady Hawk was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Sound. He's been all over the United States with over 30 features to his credit, including uh, Twister and Cruel Intentions, and over 400 episodes of popular television series such as Grey's Anatomy, Angel, One Mississippi, and House. So he's going to talk to us about actors and sound. So welcome if you would. Bo Baker. Hi. How are you doing? There he is with a cocktail. Thanks for I having me. I wouldn't recognize you without a beer. <laughs> Thank you. Well, hold on. My, my. I know. We yeah, I'm ready. ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Thank How you for that doing? introduction. By the way, when you said I've been in the business for 40 years, I don't know, little known fact, I started when I was seven. Uh, oh, wow. One of the youngest people ever in the business, so. Okay. Yeah, well, like you've it. got me beat by a year. I've been a member of Screen Actors Guild since I was eight. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. It was, you know, it was a little scary being that young on those sets, but yeah. Were you tall enough to hold the, uh, you no, know? No, I, 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 no, all I could do is like, you know, run cables back and forth. Gotcha. Anyway, anyway I'm glad you did this because, um, Actors used to actually get some practical instruction on what it's like to act in front of a camera and, and, and with a crew and all that. And nowadays, uh, unless you're, there's specific workshops for that kind of thing, which maybe there are, um, you earn or you learn while you earn. And throughout my life in, the, in this biz, there have been so many actors that have shown up as a day player and they have no clue what's required of them technically, because unfortunately this is a technical medium. And that means there are technical limits to uh, the process. And if you can't see the actor and if you can't hear the actor, then that performance won't be um, captured and no one will be able to uh, see you. So yeah, one of the things I try to convey to my students in my classes yeah. that the, every all all acting students and most actors think the whole thing is about me, and the minute you spend any time as a director or on the other side of the camera, you realize how much how little of it is actually about the actors at that point. Right, and and uh, you know, uh, here's here's what I want to talk about. Um, my background is basically union crews, scripted uh, TV movies. A lot of the credits that you mentioned, I was boom man on, not mixing. Um, but uh, now I've been a mixer for almost 20 years. And uh, 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 I, I really want uh, you guys as young actors to know a couple things. Number one, all I can talk about really is that kind of filmmaking. And secondly, and this is really unfortunate, uh, right around March 12th, the business disappeared, movie making disappeared. I mean, we were in the middle of a shot basically and they sent us home. Right. So what I talk about today is the way it used to be done up until that moment. This pandemic is going to completely change the way uh, film is made and because, um, you know, a film set is basically the opposite of social distancing. It's it's people that are thrust together very close for hours at a time. And uh, I don't know how they're going to do it. I hope they figure it out because uh, I want to get back to work. Yeah, me um, too. Yeah. So um, what I want to talk about first is, uh, first of all, the sound crew on a uh, typical set consists of three people. There's a sound mixer, and then there are two people that are called microphone operators or boom persons. Uh, sometimes uh, one is called boom person, some is called the utility. Those are kind of union terms, but both those people are vital to the process 
because um, see this, this is the microphone. If it's not where it has to be, uh, those two put it where they have to, where it has to be. I, me sitting at my sound cart, I'm not going to really record anything useful. Uh, camera records obviously this visual part, and we record the audio part of your performance. Everybody on the crew, all the departments are really uh, master crafts people. They've their career is what they do on the set, and every one of them wants the best possible uh, outcome for you, the actor. Now, if you show up as a day player on Friday night after the crew's been at work for five long nights, they may look a little grumpy, but they're still there and they still are doing 100% of their work. Um, but here's, here's the thing about the technical medium that I want to talk about. And this is really important for actors. When you get on a set, you see dozens and dozens of people standing around and it looks like no one's doing anything. Well, I'm gonna give you a little analogy. Uh, an automobile assembly line is a long line, one end no car, the other end a finished car. And every five seconds they start a new car and either robots or people are on either side assembling that car. Right. So they're always busy. But imagine if you only sent one car down that assembly line at a time, there'd be a lot of people not doing anything at any given moment, but somebody is doing something. Right. And then right. to further mess up this analogy, get it, take the line away. So you just have a lot of people standing around. Okay. So that's what a crew is. Now, yeah. the other problem that sound people have is that if there is a mistake with uh, props or wardrobe or sets or lighting, everybody can see it. They can see that the collar is not right or there's a, you know, shiny forehead or whatever. So it's real and it's there and everyone can deal with it. You can point to it. it. Point to it and then it becomes important. The problem with sound people, our thing is invisible. And believe me, that really affects our work because if we had it our way, the mic would be like right here all the time in front of the actor. Obviously that's not gonna work. So the perfect mic placement has to be out of the shot. Another thing about sound is that this frame like that has boundaries, yeah. right? Yeah. So you can't see what my fingers are doing right now. I can but, imagine, I can yeah, imagine. Uh, yeah, but if I snap my fingers, you can hear that. So right. what that means is the camera can rigidly focus on what they want you to see. Microphones, they are directional. They, you know, favor certain directions, but they hear other things that aren't supposed to be in the shot or in the scene. So that that's the other problem we have. Technically, what I'm supposed to do is record you speaking so that your uh, your voice can be used in the final product, what we record then and there on the stage. There's a lot of technologies that have developed and there's a thing called ADR, which stands for automated dialogue replacement, which means used to call looping, where after the scene has been shot and edited, if there are dialogue things that are, have to be replaced, for technical reasons, whatever, you get called back, you get into a small room with a microphone in front of you, headphones on, and then they will replay the scene you did. And it's up to you to somehow recreate the emotion and the intensity and everything else that you did on the set. Um, or sometimes I've been in situations where they've called me in because they wanted to change a line reading because they, they wanted to change the tenor of the scene actually they've made yes. a decision yeah. to have the scene be a the focus of the scene to be about something else right and then in the early days of gray's anatomy uh when they couldn't vet the medical uh dialogue um and they were in the or with their masks on they literally would rec i would record the actors going what if he medicals well then we better medical the medical and then <laughs> Later, they would figure out the exact, uh, you know, medical stuff to say. 
Right. Um, and you don't have to sync it up. Right. Because the mask hides that. So what we want to do as a sound crew is uh, record the best possible uh, performance that you have along with the camera. When they go, when we're finished shooting, that audio track goes to the editors and later they will add sound effects and music and all that other stuff to give you the final product. Uh, it's a lot easier to add to a basic clean dialogue track other effects and music than it is to try to remove things that don't belong on your audio track. The fact that ADR exists has led a lot of, uh, um, I'm trying to be generous here, uh, cost conscious producers uh, to say, hey, we'll fix it in post. Right. I am always shocked at that because, you know, what we shoot is going to be there forever. Forever and ever. Yep. And so let's get it now, you know. Now, uh, some people say, well, you know, we can't loop the picture. Okay. Could you right. pull up the, the shot of the mocap guy? Sure. Um, this always amuses me because they say, well, we can't loop the picture, meaning we have to get what we're going to get on camera right now because that's the most important thing. Oh, no, not that one. That's it right there. I don't think that's the finished visual product. I'm just, just going to throw that out there. So when I hear that, I'm like, yeah, well, guess what? The sound is important. It's half of the story. And in this day and age, and I, you know, uh, film is supposed to be a story told with pictures. Um, a lot of times it's what I would call illustrated radio. Right. If you can turn your back to the, to the screen and still follow the story, but if you were to mute the sound, I don't know whether you could follow the plot at all. Um, so it's really important. So the next thing I want to talk about is when you are a day player, because I don't think, I mean, it, your first couple jobs are going to be not a series lead, but the day player, meaning you're hired to be in maybe one or two scenes. So, uh oh, what happened? Oh, my uh, screen went blank. Um, you show up on the set. Uh, you've gone through hair, makeup, and wardrobe. The uh, Probably a production assistant is going to take you um, to the set, and that will be the whole crew standing around. Uh, you will be invited by the AD to say, where the AD will say something like, we're going to do a private rehearsal. Now, maybe some of your students think that you get weeks to rehearse with other actors. In episodic TV, you get approximately five to ten minutes private rehearsal, meaning not so many people are watching. Usually the director, script supervisor, prop person, maybe the writer, uh, yeah. roughly those kind of people. Yeah. So the scene I, I was going to use as a way to describe the process was a restaurant scene, busy date night, bustling restaurant. Our two series leads are having a romantic date dinner there, and you're the waiter coming in to wait on them. And it's let's say it's a two-page scene, meaning two minutes of screen time. And you're going to come in, you're going to say hi, you're going to give them the menus, you're going to come back, and you may pour the wine or the water. Uh, for the purposes of some illustrations, I'm going to say maybe uh, you have a couple little quiet asides you want to say to one of the guys, one of the actors, maybe in the scene you're supposed to say, don't, don't trust the escargot uh, or something, you know, that kind of thing. So they say private rehearsal, you come in. You enter, you stand at the table, you do your thing, you exit, they keep acting, you come back with the water, pour it, keep, and then maybe you're at another point on the table. So everybody's happy with that. The director says, great. The AD says, marking rehearsal. Who's Mark? Uh, yeah. At that point, the entire crew will come in and stare at you. And remember, every department is looking for some specific thing you're doing. Prop people want to make sure when you pour the water, how much you pour so they can refill it between, you know, for every take. They got to reset everything. So the sound people are watching. 
and they're watching you walk in. And it's when you stop at the table, the camera assistant actually marks you with a piece of tape on the ground between your feet, a little piece of colored tape. And that's where they expect you to land when they actually shoot it. That's kind of important because from that's where the camera will be in focus and where the lighting set up. Okay, so you say, hi, I'm here to help you out. Here are your menus. You exit. They talk. Now you come back and now you're come to the other end of the table and they mark you again there. Once that marking rehearsal is done, and it usually it's only run once, uh, so the sound department has to try to uh, guess all of your head turns, how you're gonna, how loud you're going to be, what your physical business is going to be, um, what the wardrobe is you have on, all that stuff. We're watching all that. When they when they dismiss you, a second team, which are the stand-ins, would stand in for you while they're lighting, come in. They've been watching every move you make. So now they start lighting. You go to a holding area, probably on, uh, on the stage somewhere, and a PA will come up to you and say, okay, we have to wire you. <laughs> it's like, what? I'm getting espresso? No. Uh, that means that a small little radio station, you can put that little graphic up. Um, I would have brought one of my transmitters, but it's locked up in a studio and they don't, they're not allowing anyone there right now. But a small little uh, transmitter, somewhat looking like that, well, uh, they have to put that on your body. It's called a wireless mic or body mic. Um, typically, the sound person that puts it on will be accompanied by a, a costumer. Uh, the PA might be standing by. They will uh, put a little Velcro uh, strap around your ankle and drop the wire, the microphone wire, all the way down to there, or sometimes they put it on the back of your uh, belt, on your waist, and then the mic is put somewhere up here. Um, Just so, so people uh, get, uh, get some perspective, yeah. that's uh, smaller than a pack of cigarettes, what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite small. Um, and so it's continually transmitting from the time they put it on uh, an audio signal over a radio frequency, which then comes to my sound card, it's turned back into audio. And then with the technology we have today, every actor probably is wearing one and every actor is being recorded. Each actor's uh, mic is being recorded to a separate track. In addition to that, there'll be a swinging boom pole with a mic over your head. Uh, we typically use both. Um, we've now advanced, I'm going to say advanced to the point where we use multiple cameras, uh, sometimes two or three cameras with different size shots, a wide shot and tight shot, uh, that can compromise the ability of the boom to be where it's supposed to be. Right. So we, so we rely on that. One thing that I've noticed in the depiction of sound people in motion pictures is that they're portrayed as grumpy dorks. You could show them. <laughs> From, uh, one classic example of this is in the movie, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Living in Oblivion. Uh, that's the sound mixer. And then the boom person, you can pull that one up now. I always thought that that is pretty much exactly uh, what you look like when you're at work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just do this all day. Our boom fellow, here you go. There he is. Yeah, look at that guy. Look right. Good hand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like I just said, your voice is being transmitted. From that radio mic on your body goes to me. When we roll camera, I open the fader so that people can hear you. I retransmit that out to the director and to the script supervisor and other people that are listening on a portable receiver, radio receiver called a Comtech. Now, uh, for myself and for just about everybody I've ever worked with, we don't listen to anything until they roll the camera. It's uh, 
not our position to listen to what you're saying between setups or, or talking. Some actors are afraid of that and they'll unplug their mic. And then for me, because I'm not listening to anything between shots, sometimes we roll camera and only then do I determine that they have unplugged their mic. So then we have to stop and they have to plug it back in. Um, however, and you can pull this one up, in the, in the movie Notting Hill, the third act, the big twist for the third act is that Hugh is madly in love with her and she's invited him to the set of a period movie that she's working on. And he's given by the sound mixer, the headphones. We cut to her between shots talking to another actor and the other actor at, says, who is that guy? And then she blows, says, well, he means nothing to me, blah, 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 because she doesn't really want this other actor to know about him. However, in the scene, he's actually hearing this off camera, between scenes dialogue. And because he doesn't know that she's just telling stories, it breaks his heart and he walks away. And then we go to the end of the movie. This yeah. never, ever happens. <laughs> Ever, I spent a lot of time feeling bad for Hugh Grant and and his sad romantic struggles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, especially when they arrest you. Um, uh, anyway, ethically, we don't listen to things, so please understand that you're you're wearing something that is transmitting. In certain situations, let's say you're in a car and we're pretending to be driving, they have a green screen, and later they'll add in the moving stuff. We plant mics in the car. And at that point, if there needs to be communication between the director and you, they wanna to listen to the mic that's in the car. At that point, my crew will, will always say, just so you know, we're gonna leave this mic open so the director can talk back to you. Right. And we'll remind you uh, that, you know, a lot. So. As an actor on the set, you're going to be wearing this thing. Now they call you back in. Now we're ready to film. And remember, this is the old days when we could still work together. Uh, let's say after the, they do a rehearsal and you're doing something that you didn't do in the original rehearsal, which is maybe your character has a crush on the woman at the table and you're trying not to show it, but you're nervous and you're kind of doing this kind of stuff. Some sound person might say, can you not do that? And you might get a little offended by, well, this is how I'm indicating my loss of composure or whatever. We will ask if it's possible for you not to do that. Uh, is there another way for you to express that uncomfortableness? Um, if it was boomed, then we wouldn't hear that, that cloth noise on the mic. Um, we might come to you after the rehearsal because you're pouring the water into their glasses while you're talking. Now, in the wide shot, the master, we may say, you know, you may go ahead and do that because we see you actually pouring. But right. remember when we're in the close-up and that picture is out of shot, we may ask you to mime that and then you'll pretend because we won't actually see your hand pouring it. It'll be off camera. Yeah. I, I don't do that. I don't, I don't pretend because it would, you know, that would uh, interfere. That's with one thing thought. I like about you is, you know, you're, you're just, you're, you're just like true to your actors, art. Actors make me nuts when they, when they do that stuff. You know, it, it like you say, it is a technical medium. Um, I have, uh, I want to interrupt for a minute just because no, we, no, we have one question up here, uh, which um, I think I know the answer to. Good. But, Throw oh, did up. I mention there's going to be a test at the end? A multiple oh, yeah. choice? Yeah. Oh, okay. I think I know the answer to this question. Ah, Dan Nero. He's a stand-in on the show I do and been in the business um, five times longer than I've been in the business. So you He's think you know the answer to this question already? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, now, first but of all, let's define what a background actor is, okay? Yes. Legally, what distinguishes you from being an extra or background artist is that you actually speak out loud. 
And once you speak out loud, now you are an actor and you have to be signed to a contract and the pay is much better. Um, background actors work very hard. Um, and they know, let's say we go back to this uh, restaurant scene. When we go to shoot it, they'll have put in, let's say, 30 or 40 background actors that are sitting at tables. They'll have maybe actors playing other waiters, doing crosses back and forth. All those people are skilled at the art of pretending to do everything, but doing it absolutely quietly. So they'll be looking like they're happy. They'll maybe, you know, cutting their food up and drinking, but they're making no noise. Okay. Um, it might be disconcerting to the day player playing the waiter. And here's something as you as an actor can talk about. When the scene is finished and we're watching it on whatever we're watching it on, they'll have added in the uh, bustling restaurant sounds, the pots and pans yep. in, the, in the kitchen, the chatter of people talking. Uh, maybe uh, there's a folk singer in the back. I don't know, whatever. But none of that's being recorded when we do your scene. Right. Now, it's generally uh, uh, when we talk, we normally match our voice to the situation we're in. So if we're in an ultra quiet set and we're filming, you might be tempted to talk in a quiet voice. It's when they add all that other stuff in, it's going to the energy of your performance is going to be weird. So they're going to somebody might say, can you, you know, pretend to talk up? Like it's noisy. That's it I think it's it's very hard. I think it's uh, harder for an actor to do that than to look at a, a little dot on the wall and pretend it's Godzilla. Well, it's something that I talk about in my classes all the time is environment, because it happens in on on stage as well. Uh, because frequently now, of course, you have a scene with two people on stage but they are in a ostensibly in a crowded bar and you have, and you may start the scene with it going in the scene transition. You may have some ambient noise that the sound designer has laid in there to let us know we're in a crowded singles bar and the two actors yeah. show up at the little cocktail table and all, all that sound disappears and the actors play the scene. And I'm always in class. I'm always telling my actors, you know, you still have to be aware of that environment and play right. the scene with the energy of the environment because otherwise the whole illusion disappears, even though the sound yeah. is gone once the scene starts. Right, right. Yes, and that's that's a part of your acting craft that you have to master. Let me tell you a quick story about um, how a really great actor deals with stuff like that. Um, Brian Dennehy and Hector. Dr. Elizondo were in a TV movie miniseries, whatever it was, uh, years ago. And they had a scene in the Chicago Board of Trade, which is where they sell commodity market. And right. it's this vast mm -hmm. room with the board, with all the lights. We came in on a Saturday and they brought in the actual real life traders on their day off. They put on their colored jackets and they had a walk and talk through this crowded environment. And uh, the director wanted us to shoot. Brian said, no, before we go, I want to know how loud it is in here. Director rolled his eyes and said, all right. So the AD told all of the assembled, we want you to be as loud as you are on a typical trading day. And the actors are going to walk through their scene and go for it. So when they said action, it was the most amazing cacophony I've ever heard. Because these are guys screaming the sells and buys. They were amazing. Uh, and the actors did their thing. I couldn't hear them. Right. <laughs> but they did the scene. We also took it upon ourselves to record that at the time, just the crowd noise so they could do it later. So when the scene was actually filmed, it was absolutely amazing to watch these two guys. Now they're shouting and they nailed it, but it added just so much. And just taking the three minutes to uh, rehearse, they were able then to bring to the party that whole energy of them being in this bustling place. 
Right. Well, that's, that's crucial cool. information for the actor. You have yeah. to know your environment. You, you can't right. do your job if you don't know your environment. Here's um, another thing. Here's one more thing I want to mention. Sure. Long time ago, the convention of stage whisper was invented, meaning it's an aside, but it has to be loud enough for the people in the back row to hear. Right? <laughs> right. I, I actually was in a, a UCLA library years and years ago, and there was a scene, and we could not hear the actors speak. They were whispering because it was a library. And when we went to the director and said, they got to be a little louder, he said, well, but it's a library. <laughs> yeah. This was, in, this was in a play. This No, this was in a, a TV movie I did. But they were... Okay. Now, but and yeah, so here's my question. You yeah. as sound dude. Yeah, sound dude. We can pick that up though if I'm talking like that, if 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 you need want that in the mix, right? Because I, I mean th here's my question. A lot of a lot of a lot of us come from primarily being trained for the stage. That's right. that's where I came from. Being primarily a, I worked in film and television, but every time I worked uh, uh, early in my career. Every time I worked on a TV show, it was after, you know, being on Broadway for six months and then going to do an episode of, of Law and Order. And after the, after the rehearsal, the sound guy would come up to me and say, theater actor, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, then I was doing an episode of um, Special Victims Unit. And uh, it was a scene with Chris Maloney. Okay. At the, at the end of the episode, and I was standing about two and a half feet from him, and I couldn't hear his lines. How about? And I kept, I, I, I kept getting closer and closer to him because I felt like we were having a whisper off. Um, so my question is, you know, I know these these voiceover guys, you know, who've learned that. If they pitch it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning into my mic, you know, if they pitch it way down and talk really quietly, they can get this quality in their voice that they're not going to get if they're speaking at full volume. Uh, is that what some actors are doing so that you have to bump them up or cap capture a different quality in their voice? Because he wasn't speaking to me the way he would have been speaking to me in the moment because I couldn't hear him. Yeah. How about that? Um, no, I mean, I, I, no, I, I'm trying to, I, I'm exaggerating. No, I, I could hear him. And I actually felt like I walked away from that learning something about craft yeah. Yeah. because his voice sounds amazing. Um, yes, there are actors that um, uh, are very quiet. And when you're under ideal conditions and it's quiet set, uh, maybe you, we can hear all that. But uh, remember that a microphone, unlike humans, uh, does not have a brain. Uh, we've evolved to be able to f uh, filter out anything we don't want to hear. Just ask a teenager. And... Uh, so let's say right now there's a fan spinning over my head, the refrigerator's going, um, you know, I'm tuning all that out because I'm focusing on what you're saying, but the microphone doesn't have that ability. So if we're, if, if you're in that scene, it is possible that with the close mic on the person that they can hear that. But when we have to, uh, what we call pull for it or, you know, push the faders up to try to get that quietude, we're also raising the noise floor. So everything else is being uh, increased as well. So, you know, on a show like um, Grey's Anatomy, where they have 70 background a day uh, right. working, and it's supposed to be a busy, bustling hospital, that can be a real challenge because all of those, uh, all of those just walking around footstep stuff are part of the, what we call the noise floor of that scene. Right. We try well, this to- was, This was a very yeah. intimate scene. It was just that um, it was just the two of us, tight right. close-ups on both of us, and a and a very difficult uh, relationship moment. So, right. 
And I, I felt like, you know, that was one of those moments where I saw an actor doing something that I didn't understand. And that right. to me in, in the moment didn't make any sense. But I also said to myself, this guy's been doing this show for seven years. Right. Probably knows some things that I don't know. Maybe I should pay attention and do what he's doing. And when Maybe. you, well, well, when you watch the scene, it actually, it, it brings this really nice texture to it. You, you know, you can hear both of us crystal clear, obviously, but it brings a, a, a texture and a depth to what's happening that I don't think would have been there otherwise. Yeah. Hey, I just heard somebody go by. Uh, was, uh, yeah. Yeah. That was your Harley. There's a lot of guys uh, during COVID who are, uh, who are doing a lot of compensating. Yes. With, I know. By, by using their muscle cars and their motorcycles to let us yeah. know. How manly good, they good are. thing that ha never happened before COVID. Um, it's happening a lot more now. Oh yeah, uh, yes. So in a, a there there are when you're being a really quiet scene and uh, you know there were cast on um, on a lot of shows that were very quiet actors. You have your techniques as a sound person to try to uh, either coax it out of them. I mean, I've many countless times I've said to them, can you just a little more, a little more, a little uh, more. just a little more. What, what do stage actors need to know coming into this environment? Uh, do they need to do a little less? Well, I think that as you, you probably tell them this, but when you're on stage, you're pushing out and when you're on camera, you're inviting in. So, right you know, if you learn that part of your craft, you're going to be able to uh, adapt to what, what goes on, you know, a lot. I mean, a lot, really, when you're on a set, a lot of actors say, you know, how tight are we? Where, where are we? Meaning right. where, how much are you focused just on this? So, uh, and then there are some great actors that uh, uh, don't want to be in the ADR stage. And if they hear something that is uh, distracting to them, they'll stop and say, you know, because a lot of, you know, the, the crunch of production on uh, movies or fighting the, the light or we got to get the kid off the clock, whatever, they may decide to keep rolling through something that's not acceptable. Sometimes as an actor, you can say, can you hear that? And uh, you get a second chance at it. Another right. thing I want to talk about film acting is that uh, I have done this on occasion, rare. It has to do with my relationship personally with who I'm working with. But um, we're not shooting in order. And uh, let's say uh, you've come from outside and you're agitated. And then a week later, we shoot the part where you come inside. Um, I have, depending on, you know, my relationship with them, I may say, hey, you were a little louder when we did that outside part. Mm -hmm. Trying not to be the director, but just to let them know the energy level is different. And a lot oh, of times, yeah. yeah, and a lot of times um, uh, after you do take after take or, if, you know, shot after shot, a scene, of course, is the entire scene we see. The shots are what are the component parts of that scene. So wide shot, close up, close up, close up, relight, relight, all that. So sometimes the energy flags after six hours doing the same scene, somebody may from the sound department say, hey, you know, you were doing this then, maybe you wanna try that again. Uh, right. It's a, it just gets sensitive because we don't particularly want to uh, tread on your, the actual art of your performance. What we're trying to do is make sure that your performance is consistent with what we've been recording. Yeah. When we work together, you and I, yeah. you will never be treading on the art of my performance. It's, you don't have to worry about that. I'm just, you know. Especially after the fourth cocktail. I just yeah. got my eye on the martini, buddy. That's all I'm waiting for. Cheers. <laughs> yes, so let's see, have I mentioned or, um, uh, I this think is we covered everything. I wanted to ask you. Yes. Because the line is so often quoted. 
I'm assuming you were there for it. <laughs> when they first said it? Yeah. Tears in the rain. Tears oh, yeah. in rain. You were there for that. I was there for that. Um, well, part of it. Uh, that particular movie went so far over schedule that the mixer I was working with had had a commitment on another movie. So we left and that final scene, part of it was shot while we were there. And then when they got into the actual close-ups, they uh, had to move the entire rooftop set onto a stage because the sun came up. So you weren't there for it? Sort of, yeah. Wow. And um, I just want, yeah, and I just want you to know one thing. I have a feeling they replaced that because the rain was pounding. And he was bare-chested, so he wasn't wearing a, a body mic. Unless it was, you know, he was a tough guy. He may have had them just, you know. Surgically. Well, we yeah. keep asking actors, you know, the real committed actor, you know, could do that, have them implanted. He, he was a pretty tough dude. Yes, he was. Um, God bless him. Uh, ah, Dan has another question here. Yes. Another technical thing. Thanks, Dan. Uh, overlapping dialogue. What does that mean? Uh, if we're having an if argument, what? Like the, what, what are you talking about? Talking uh, like what? At the same time? Well, see, we have two cameras going, so we do. So it should everything be. that we're saying right now is covered, right? Right. Okay. If if you're doing a scene where you are uh, overlapping, meaning you're cutting off somebody or you're interrupting them, uh, when they shoot the main master shot, um, you have to uh, do your thing. You're going to interrupt each other. If there are multiple cameras shooting all that then that's okay. What happens in the editorial process is that if I am still talking while you're talking, they're going to have to adjust the editorial cut moment until my dialogue ends. Because if they don't, then you're going to dub what they call double up. So you, you might be saying the word and then you say it again kind of thing. Right. So what it, the reason they don't like overlaps and close-ups is that a means that the editor has more choice of when to actually cut from one shot to the next. And a lot of actors really very quickly learn to, uh, you know, do that thing. And then, then the other actor can come in and then that weird gap is edited out. And then it sounds as though they are still overlapping. Thank you, Dan. Thumb so tracks. Thumb tracks. Yes. Okay. Uh, to the uninitiated, that sounds almost dirty. Uh, here's I what have a, no idea what that is. Well, good. Here you go. Uh, let's say uh, at this dinner scene, the band starts playing, and the couple at the table decide to dance, and they're doing you know this romantic dance, and they're talking uh, uh, during this dance. Well, you can't have the music playing over their dialogue. But everybody that's dancing has to dance to the same beat. Okay? So enter the thumb track. It is a, a weird thing where a very low frequency boom, boom, is being pumped out of these speakers, and you kind of almost feel it. It's really low uh, in frequency so that they can uh, remove it fairly easily uh, in post. Sometimes it doesn't even transfer out. So uh, it's almost the sound equivalent of green screen. They can remove it. Yes, because it's so such a low frequency, but it's pounding out um, this beat mm -hmm. so that all everybody can be on the same page that is and the same beat so that when they... And then also, as from shot to shot, that track is the same tempo, so they're not going to suddenly vary and be dancing fast or slow. Right. So, and then it's also going to be covered because in the final mix of the movie, you're going to have the music laid in there. Yes, they'll add the actual song they got the rights to or they recorded it. So, yeah. Right. But thank you. That was a good point. Um, uh, thumb tracks can be a little weird if you don't know what they are because, it, it, like I said, you kind of feel it. It's sort of like when you pull up to a stoplight and some guy's got the, the uh, music playing, his windows are rolled up, and you can't hear the music, but you can hear that... Right. Because, 
low frequencies can travel better than high. So that's why you hear that. So that's what a thumb track. I personally like moose tracks, which is the ice cream. With the, yes. But that's a whole, that's a whole. So, yeah. a so whole thank other. you. Those are two good questions. Thank Dan and whoever asked that question. Yeah. Uh, any other questions for, for Bo? Uh, keep them coming. Um, oh, be, be uh, as an actor on the set, be aware that everybody is there to uh, make you sound and look as good as possible. So in the old world, between shots, you were touched up by hair and makeup. The, uh, between takes, the wardrobe people will be adjusting everything. Uh, the sound person may ask, you know, may come and adjust the mic. If it's a long scene, they may need to change the battery on the transmitter. So there will be people touching you, or used to, some people being around you all the time on a set. And they want you to understand that they're there uh, to help you and help your performance. You know, um, you get so used to that as an actor, to people touching you and futzing with you, that I remember uh, when I was uh, younger, uh, visiting my dad on set one day, and on a bet, he was sitting in his chair, having a, a very intense conversation with another actor, and on a bet, somebody went up to him and they took off his watch and they started taking off pieces of his clothing and they got him, and he stood and, you know, like raised his foot so they could take the shoe off. And he was, because he was involved in this very intense conversation. I love this. And they got <laughs> him down to his undershirt, boxer shorts and socks and then everybody just walked away and he was sitting there still in this conversation for That's several bad. minutes. And then suddenly he stopped and he was like, what, what, what the heck? And then looked around, and everybody was just standing around watching him. And then the, you know, big yes. laugh and a round of applause. I love that. I love that. The guy, the guy so who had undressed him took a bow. And, <laughs> but you do, you, you get used to, Yes, and I know there's a lot of sensitivity around this now, around being touched and et cetera. And there, uh, uh, you know, I know that boundaries have been crossed. Uh, but on the flip side of that is that for some of us, you just get so used to people futzing. And one of my favorite images of of movie making is the idea of that these hundreds of people that you're talking about huge production cameras cranes lights a million things going on and everything getting ready for that shot and it's just about to go and then you hear somebody say uh hold what hold on one second and somebody comes running in and they lean into the actor and they they reach up and they move well they wouldn't do it on me anymore no. but in the old days when i had hair like yours they would just kind of go and move a hair a little bit and then say, okay, we're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I always wanted a scene in a movie where they're watching dailies, which is the day after they shoot, they're projecting the previous day's work on a screen in a small studio theater and all the department heads are there and they'd be playing this one scene, but we'd cut to each craft person's point of view of their own private nightmare. So you'd cut to the wardrobe person and there'd be a great big, you know, thing on the shoulder or something bad. But then when we cut to the uh, sound guy, all they can hear it, you know, that's gone, but they hear his feet scraping on the gravel or they cut to the camera assistant and this focus is, way out of whack. You know, like everyone has their own little private nightmare on a set because we're all actually watching that. So that person actually right. went and did that because they they knew that in the previous shot, the hair was right, had to be right where it's supposed to be. On, on 100 Center Street, there was a woman who between every take would come up to me, pull my jacket open, smooth my shirt front, tuck, make sure it was tightly tucked in, check my my tie because the mic was in the tie right in the knot of the tie she get everything smooth close my jacket and walk away 
between every day she was fixing my shirt front and that's that's that technician that person was uh uh, honored their craft and they honored the character you were playing. And uh, that's great. And, you know, there's, you've seen still shots, you know, of, an, of a major star and someone's holding an umbrella over their head. Yep. It's not because they demand that kind of attention. That is probably a PA. They're holding an umbrella umbrella. over the costume, not the, uh, the, hair and exactly. the, the hair and the costume. Right. <laughs> so somebody asked uh, about, uh, recommendation for reasonably priced mics for self tapes and filming. Um, that is the subject of an entirely weird, different conversation. It's a good question and it's an honest one. Here's the problem. Um, I once had a, a producer who used to, in between uh, jobs, would take a script, break it down, schedule it, and budget it. And the question he was invariably asked by whoever, you know, paid him to do this job, they'd say, how much is this movie going to cost to make? And his answer was always the same. How much do you want to spend? So right. in terms of the actual hardware of what we use, um, in my line of work, I can afford the, you know, highest level pro stuff which is extremely expensive. One of just one of those transmitters is, you know, between fifteen hundred and twenty five hundred dollars. The microphone's another four to five hundred dollars. So multiply that by twenty different transmitters, you see how fast that that adds up. If you're starting out and you want uh, to buy some equipment, you have to uh, decide how. You know, first of all how much you can spend. And then within that budget range, there's pro stuff, prosumer stuff, and then there's kind of, you know, home movie stuff. So it depends what you can afford and it depends um, uh, what you're doing. I mean, this is pretty easy. I can just plant the mic right in front of me. And this is, I think, a $200 mic, this, uh, this particular one. And it's designed exactly for what we're doing. It's for podcasts and webcasts and stuff like Is that the blue yeah yeah that's yeah. what uh yeah you got the you got the hip um the hip uh yeah mine's the silver one uh so anyway um i sorry i can't be more specific with brand names and stuff but it's it it's so dependent on what you can really afford yeah now there we would recommend to sid a there's a road lav mic that i use that works really well um, but, uh, Sid, you and I can, uh, shoot me an email and, uh, and we can talk about, uh, your options for that. Um, yeah. Danny has another, uh, uh -oh. qu quick question. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, they are expensive <laughs> and I could, there's dozens and dozens of stories where actors get cavalier with that stuff. Some actors are, uh, extremely um, uncooperative about wearing one of those mics. Um, and I can understand it. It's an invasion of your personal space. Uh, uh, I can't understand it. Okay. Because if you're worried about people invading your personal space, there are a lot of jobs that I can recommend <laughs> to you other than being an actor. Right. Exactly. Um, it's like, you know, I, I want to be an airline pilot, but I really don't like the idea of flying. So, and right. you need to respect that. Right. No, I get that. But uh, see, that's why I like you. Uh, <laughs> as an actor, when you're required to scream or shout very loudly, you need to hold back at all. No, here's what you do need to do, though. If you're doing that marking rehearsal, and let's say you want to save your voice for that emotional scene, it would be nice if you were to tell the sound department before you yelled that you're about to yell. If, if let's say on the first four takes, you're in a normal tone of voice, and then suddenly you decide on take five to, to try something new and scream, um, it, you might get some feedback on that. They might say, well, I was prepared for you to be in a low voice. You screamed and it distorted. Now that is really not usable. If you want to do that again, uh, we may want to, 
you know, know about it ahead of time. So I don't, I'm saying do not hold back on your performance in terms of the technical part, but if you're going to change something, let the, let the people know. Yeah. Communicate. It's a good idea. I'm so glad you're doing this, Bo, because, you know, I'm telling my students all the time that the more you know about everybody else's job, the better you're going to be at your job as an actor. Same thing as a sound guy. The more you know about what actors do and what they need, the yeah. better you're going to be at your job. The more I know about what you need, the better I'm going to be at my job. Um, and we're it, all there to solve the problem. You're there yeah. as an actor saying, I'm going to take this thing that's written on a page and bring it to life and, and all that. So I'm going to solve that problem for you. And, uh, I'm going to solve your sound problems for you. Right. Like I said, if I come, if I come to you with an issue, then I'll, it's usually something that I think can be fixed with a minimum amount of pain or, or whatever. I always love the ex an example of the importance of communication that I that I talk about is the people on set who are constantly yelling flashing, and the reason they're doing that when they take a photograph of a prop or the way a table is set up or the way your jacket is askew is they need to keep track of that, but their camera is going to flash. And they're not doing it because flashes annoy people or to get people to protect their eyes. They're doing it because equipment, when it goes wrong and blows up or a light that goes out, makes a flash. Right. And if they don't say flashing, then one of the sparks, I'm sorry, that's British, right? One of the electricians yeah. one of is going to think that a piece of equipment blew and right. start looking for it. Exactly. And yes, that's that. Yes, that's really good. Uh, nowadays, though, they don't really have to flash so much anymore. But yes, that 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 is an issue. Um, can a studio sound engineer from the music industry cross over to film? Is it realistic? Sure. Um, uh, a really good friend of mine's boyfriend is a uh, studio recording engineer, and uh, he asked me, "What's the hardest thing about being a sound recordist for film?" And I said, we can't put the mic where we want it to be. And I'll never forget his reaction. He stared at me as if I had just landed from another planet. Because the idea that you can't put the mic exactly where it should be is absolutely foreign to him. When you're on a recording studio, music recording studio or whatever that is, you put the mic where you want it. And that's it. Uh, so yes, the hardest adjustment you will make going from uh, front of house mixing, concert mixing, or re record mixing is that you're no longer the monarch. <laughs> you're not. The, the, they're going to set the shot for the camera, and then you get to figure out where to put the mic to get the best sound possible and not get in the shot. Um, now, technically, nowadays, there are certain situations where they can literally paint the mic out. And, and depending on the style of the, of the show, I think it was the House of Cards, they had really locked off static shots. And they could bring the mics right overhead, and then they just roll a few frames of the clean frame, and then they could just replace that. Uh, it's a little more difficult when you get into walk and talks and all this other stuff. But right. um, if you're going from that kind of a sound recording to film recording, that is a, probably the hardest thing to deal with. And you're going to get people saying, hey, we can fix it later. And you're like, no, I want to get it good now. Right. And you have to deal with that kind of attitude because that's pervasive. I mean, it really is. There you go. Well, I want to thank you for coming in. Uh, before we wrap up, I just have uh, two more questions. Um, okay. Uh, what is the best story that you have that you can tell? Oh, my God. Well, you know, I was so young when we started. I don't remember all those early stories. Now, uh, I think the uh, I think the greatest. Uh, well, there's one there's one moment um, that I just personality. Robert Wagner was in a um, mini series I did when I was starting out. 
and we were filming in Hawaii. And the early technology of these new kind of lights, which I think were used to be called HMIs, I think was the brand name. But instead of a carbon arc, which was an actual electrical spark going, you know, and lighting, they developed right. this electronic lamp that put out a huge amount of light. But they needed a power supply. And these early power supplies had big fans and they buzzed and they were just ridiculous. And also the early lamps would sing. They would put out some high frequency thing and all that. So we were in front of the, we, we, were, in, we were in front of the Ilion, Iliani Palace, pardon me, if I did, but that's the uh, uh, original Royal Palace there. And it did, and it was a period show. I think your brother was in this miniseries, and uh, Pearl. yes, and yeah. uh, they've dressed it to look like uh, it's been sandbagged and it's the headquarters. And there's this it's big the police, scene. It's the police headquarters on Hawaii Five O now. Oh, it is okay. Yeah. Cool. So uh, it's a very famous landmark, and they lit it all bright. And Robert Wagner had to come in, and he had to talk. And uh, the mixer said, um, I keep hearing those damn lights. And so <laughs> they rolled camera out and take three or four. And Wagner ran over and he went poof. And he pulled the plug and all the lights went off. He went there. And he went up and pretended to start acting. <laughs> the whole thing was black. But he said, there, we solved that problem. <laughs> so I just thought that was funny. But there are, okay. you know, there are many, there are many others ones. Yeah. The other question is, what is yeah. the best story that you have that you can't tell? Okay, so we wrapped, <laughs> and I went into his motorhome. Yeah. Oh, wait, okay. was, hey, well. oh. Okay. No, it was, just, it was full okay. of smoke and stuff. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Right. Yeah. Listen, I want to thank you so much uh, for coming in. And, sure. Uh, or, or for not coming in, but for not going anywhere. Yeah, uh, I haven't seen you. I haven't seen you in person since whatever. Yeah, I know it's been a while. Yeah. Um, but this was really great. A lot of helpful, useful information. Good. For Thank you. Um, I want to let everybody know that next week our guest will be Seth Barish, who is the co-founder and co-artistic director of the Barrow Group in New York, which is a theater company and conservatory. Uh, they have a wonderful acting program. Uh, Seth played Dr. Gilbert on uh, Billions. You can look him up on IMDb. He worked with my father in going in style. Uh, he played my husband, or I played his husband, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, in uh, Margot at the Wedding. And he is the author of this book, um, An Actor's Companion, Tools for the Working Actor. So he's going to join us next week. Perfect. Uh, It'll have to be a little earlier, but also um, subscribe to this channel and ring the bell icon so that you get notifications of upcoming live streams and uh, sign up for my newsletter. All of the information about how to do that is in the comments uh, below this video. And Bo, thank you again so much. Sure. This has been just really, really um, uh, fantastic to have you here. Thank you very much, man. And I will uh, talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.